Okay, well, we're going to finish today with uh, the real honor of having Bob Wachter with us as our second keynote speaker. And, and Dr. Wachter comes to us from UC San Francisco, and uh, he's known for many, many things. Um, I think it was in 1996 when you coined the term the hospitalist. I think he wrote about it in the New England Journal of Medicine. And at the time, recognized that there was this problem where there was uh, an unmet need in the healthcare system uh, for a specialist who takes care of patients in the hospital. And at the time, the model was that doctors would work in their clinic or office, then run across the street to the hospital, and then run back again, and it was inefficient. It wasn't a good use of their time. And it made more sense to have somebody stationed in the hospital whose job it is to take care of hospitalized patients, and thus was born the hospitalist, which we all now know as uh, an entire area of medicine. Uh, since that time, sort of fast forward now 22 years, or maybe 20 years when you wrote uh, The Digital Doctor, sort of recognize that we have a new unmet need. Now that we have remote patient monitoring and wearable biosensors and all sorts of other opportunities to reach beyond the four walls of this hospital, the new unmet need is how do we manage patients in the community where they actually live, work, and play. People spend 99.9% .9 of their lives far away from a hospital like this. They're at the senior centers, and they're at, as we've seen, they're at home, they're at work, they're at the park, but they're not here in a hospital like this. So whose job is it to monitor those patients when they're in the community using all these different uh, devices and sensors and remote monitoring? And that is sort of becoming a new type of doctor, the digitalist. The digitalist whose job it is to understand how to monitor these patients in the community. So that was the subject largely of a fantastic book that uh, I have all my own students, I recommend that they read, The Digital Doctor. And in that book, uh, Dr. Wachter really goes through where are we with digital health broadly and, and brings, that, brings a very clinical approach to it. He's the chairman of medicine at UCSF, really one of the top medical medicine departments, internal medicine departments in the country. And he has a virtually no background in virtual reality, which is exactly why he's here to talk with us, because I wanted somebody from the outside so that we don't you know, drink the Kool-Aid and get too excited about one another's work, somebody from the outside who has been through, the, as he says here, the bumpy road of implementing health information technologies and has seen what works and really what does not work, which he writes about in a very compelling way in, uh, in his book, which has now been studied uh, extensively for you know, the, the work that you've done. So I can sit here, of course, and talk forever about you. So I'll stop there and welcome you, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, uh, thank you. I never could. So turn on. Here we go. Here. Not quite. Turn it on, please. Hmm. Testing. Is it is it uh, clicked on? Are the power on? Uh, Check that. Let's try that, testing one, two, three. There we go. Uh, great. So it's great to be here, end of a long day. I'm, I'll try to go, uh, go quickly, and I'm keeping you from, uh, from dinner and refreshments. Uh, but it is an honor to be here, and uh, I've been here the entire day, and I've learned a ton. As, as uh, Brendan said, I, uh, when he asked me to come and speak, I said, are you sure? Because this is something I know very little bit about. Uh, but I, first of all, I learned a lot, and second of all, I do think the context that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is actually quite important. Uh, let me tell you, I came to digital. I, um, I've been interested in thinking about patient safety for a very long time, really for the last 15 to 20 years. And I live in the Bay Area, and those two things you couldn't help but think that digital is going to cure all the ills of healthcare. And that's what I was thinking when digital entered my world, largely in the form of an electronic health record. And I saw that digital made things better, certainly, and I fully believe that my hospital is safer now than it was before we, had, uh, before we had technology. But I saw all kinds of unanticipated consequences uh, that were just surprising to me. It wasn't as easy as any of, uh, any of us thought, and we saw all sorts of bumps along the way. And then one day at my hospital, which is a fantastic uh, hospital, uh, we gave a kid a 39-fold overdose of a common antibiotic. Uh, the correct dose was one pill. We gave the kid 39 pills. This was in a fully electronic system with computerized order entry, barcoding, the works. And it, it's an error that could not have happened when we were on paper. It happened, of course, because there was a little glitch in terms of the original prescription, but then alerts fired and people ignored them because they got hundreds of alerts a day. And the pharmacist who normally would have had to uh, pour out the, uh, the, the antibiotic had been replaced by a robot. And then a nurse 
saw an order for 39 pills. This is an absurd, absolutely absurd order. This would be like driving down the highway and seeing a side sign that said speed limit is 2,500 miles per hour. That's a 39-fold overdose. Mm. And she said, that seems weird, but she said, I'll just check to be sure it's right. And she barcodes it. She trusts the technology more than she trusts her own instinct. And of course, the barcode at that moment believes that the correct dose is 39 pills because that's what the doctor ordered. That's what the pharmacist improved. And so the barcode said, yes, that's right, 39 pills. So she gave this kid 39 pills. He had a grand mal seizure, uh, spent a week in the ICU, just by dumb luck, didn't die. And uh, I assume he'll never have a urinary tract infection for the rest of his life because it's a lot of antibiotics. So I came home and uh, said to my, uh, my, my wife, uh, as a journalist, writes for the New York Times, and I said, Katie, this is unbelievable. This is sort of medicine's changing before our eyes, and although there are some wonderful things about technology, there are some parts about it that are harder than we thought, and there are a lot of unanticipated consequences. I think I want to write a book about this. And she said, that's just a fabulous idea. You should, uh, but you're going to have to do it journalistically. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, you're going to have to go out and talk to people. And I said, I hate people. <laughs> and she says, I'm well aware of that. But the only way you're going to get this right is doing that. So I spent a year of my life running around the country, and in fact, the world spent a little bit of time in the UK as well, uh, talking to doctors, to nurses, to manufacturers, spent time at Epic, spent time with the IBM Watson people, spent time at Boeing to see how they do cockpit computer design. I wanted to try to understand what this whole thing was about. And I came to understand that uh, we're in the early phases of what ultimately will be quite wonderful, and I think what I've learned today tells me that this is part of that, uh, but it is much harder than it looked, and, and we did not understand how complex it was, uh, and therefore we weren't prepared for the bumps along the way. So I'm going to tell you about some of my observations, some of the things that I think are relevant to understanding the role of virtual reality, because I think it kind of fits into the broader tapestry. Let me start with the big picture. I'm surprised no one has said this today, but it's very important to recognize uh, that this is all happening at another juncture in healthcare, and, and, and that is that we are under intense pressure to improve value in a way that we were not 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the best hospital and the worst hospital got paid the same. You had no idea who they were. The best doctor, the worst doctor, got paid the same. Nobody knew who they were either. These are the medical students at UCSF. They're absolutely wonderful and smart and wildly optimistic. And I was meeting with them a couple of years ago. They seemed a little bit too cheerful. <laughs> and I decided that they didn't really understand what life as a practicing physician was like. So I, I, I said to them, folks, you should understand that you're entering a, entering a profession totally unlike the one I entered 30 years ago because you will be under intense, relentless, unremitting pressure to figure out how to deliver the highest quality, safest, most satisfying care at the lowest possible cost. He's really trying to shake him up. And one of the students raised his hand and he said, what exactly were you trying to do? And I said, that's just a great question. So it is remarkable that one of the massive changes in the healthcare world that we find ourselves in now is that we are under tremendous and growing pressure to deliver high value care. What's weird about that is not that we are having that pressure. What's weird is that it's new. But it is tricky, and we're all trying to figure it out. And that is sort of an uber context for everything you've heard today. Because ultimately, the business case for this new technology is going to have to fit into a universe where every healthcare system, no matter how wonderful, no matter how bright and shiny, no matter what its US news ranking is, is going to have to demonstrably deliver high value care. That will be how they are measured. That will be how they, uh, how they succeed or fail uh, in terms of their business. So that's that's one big deal. The second big deal, and I'd say VR is a small, probably growing in, uh, in growing importance, but a small part of a larger trend, and that is the, the digitization of the entire healthcare system. So if you look here, this is a curve of electronic health records in American hospitals over the past 10 years, and here is the take home message. A decade ago, fewer than one in 10 American hospitals had an electronic health record. Today, fewer than one in 10 does not. So really, just in the past decade, we've gone from the most information-intensive business I know of, but whose information backbone was the piece of paper, the post-it note, the fax machine, the three-ring binder, to one whose information backbone now is the electronic health record. That's a huge deal and sets us up for transformation and, of course, for disruption as well. How did this happen? This was because the federal government threw $30 billion at us 
as part of the stimulus package uh, in 2000, uh, beginning in 2010, and it got all of us to say now is the time uh, we better adopt electronic health records, and pretty much we all did. So here is my view of the universe, and again, I'm, 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 I'm talking at a very high level. What we've been hearing all day is very close to the ground. Here is this new technology, and here are the wonderful things it can do, and I'm sold. If I had terrible pain or was anxious about something, I'd want it. It's pretty cool, and I love going out to the demos. That was, it, was, it was wonderful. Uh, but I think it's important to see it in a much, much larger context. Here's the context. There are two transformative trends in medicine today. One is this new pressure to deliver high-value care. The second is that our, compute, our healthcare system has become a digital system just in the last few years. If you ask me what the bigger one of these is today or tomorrow morning when I drive to work, I run a large department of medicine with 800 faculty and 3,000 employees and uh, five or six different sites. What's the one that consumes me? There's no question. It's the value pressure. It's how do we deliver care that's better, safer, uh, more equitable, more accessible, with happier patients and lower costs? No question. If you ask me seven, eight years from now, I can't believe that it will not have turned out to have been the digitization of the healthcare field. Why do I say that? I say that because I cannot think of another industry in any, in any other walk of life that 15 years after widespread digitization had not been turned upside down. That, try to think of one if you can. I can't think of one, whether it's if you used to drive a yellow cab, if you used to run a hotel, if you used to be a journalist, uh, if you used to run a big box, a box store and been replaced by Amazon, there really is no industry that 15 years after the industry was digital, basically the information flowed seamlessly through the system uh, in, in digital form, had not been turned upside down, including, here we sit in one of America's great hospitals, I work in another one, including the leading players at the beginning no longer being the leading players at the end and many of them being out of business. Does it mean this, this place could be out of business? Probably not. Our place? Probably not. But there will be massive threats to our business model that are just beginning to emerge. These are the contextual issues that we need to understand as we think about any new technology. Now, as I said, I approach the computerization of healthcare with great optimism. I, I like technology. I tweet. I make my reservations on open table. I FaceTime my parents in Florida. Florida and my kid, including one in Los Angeles. Um, so, of course, it was going to be easy, wonderful. Think about your iPhone, you download an app, you just click I accept, you don't read the instructions, and it's completely self-evident how to use it. So what could go wrong? That was my attitude coming into it. And as I've already mentioned to you, I think plenty went wrong, in part because we didn't understand how wildly complex this is, particularly when applied to something as important and as complicated with as much regulatory uh, uh, sort of regula regulations and all the other things we're well aware of in healthcare. So let me talk about a few things that went wrong. Here's, uh, here's probably the most central one that went wrong. This is a seven-year-old girl who went to see her pediatrician a few years ago. Uh, she's, a, she's an artist. She drew her, a crayon recollection of her visit to the doctor. <laughs> and you see there, there she is, mom, sister, and there in the corner typing away back to the patient is the physician. I think this is a spectacular drawing. Does anybody notice anything the girl got wrong? The smile on the doctor's face. So that's the only thing she got wildly wrong because we know that rates of burnout among American physicians have gone up 10% in the last three or four years. And when you ask doctors why I am burned out, they blame their computer first and foremost. Now, is it really the computer? Is it really Epic's fault and all that? Well, not really. I mean, the computer has become an enabler for all sorts of other oversight, loss of autonomy. It's enabled 24-hour access of patients to their doctors without us figuring out the business model to, to allow doctors to survive with 24-hour expectation of being accessible to your patients. It makes me worried when I hear, even as we were thinking about the last talk, that your physician in the, in, 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 in the Lake District, who it was so wonderful that the patients are doing their pulmonary, pulmonary uh, act, rehab on their thing, and all of the data is, is going to the physician. And he's very happy about it, of course, because he invented the tool. But I can tell you, I hear this periodically, how wonderful is the world going to be when all 2,000 of your patients, if you're a primary care doctor, all have sensors, all are filling out surveys in the morning, blowing into their iPhone and doing this, and all of that data is going to their primary care physician. Isn't that going to be great? There is not one primary care physician I know 
who, if that happened, would not need to put on one of your VR machines <laughs> and go off on a beach somewhere for about a month. That, that is not doable. That does not work. So if we don't think about the work and the workflow and the people and how the hell is that all going to work, we're going to get it wrong. And I think in some ways, the more we enable sort of patient digital tools without thinking about the model of who's going to actually see the data and act on it, if we say, oh, that just, that just will be fine in the old model, in the old system, that's just not right. So I think this is one we got really quite wrong. Here's another one that I found quite interesting that I certainly hadn't thought of. When I was a medical student at the University of Pennsylvania a long time ago, the central hub of the hospital was not in the C-suite, it was not in the fanciest operating room. It was in the dimly lit uh, a room in the basement of the hospital in the chest radiology reading room where this gentleman, his name was Wally Miller, held court every day. And what happened was you, if you were on a medicine team, so I was a med student on a medicine team, you would go down to radiology and every team, one after another, like cars going through a car wash, would come down and look at their films with Wally Miller. Just a, he was a wonderful teacher, brilliant guy, very, sort of a character. And I, most of you are young and you're all very digital, so I just want to make sure this is clear. These things back here, these are called films. <laughs> uh, you've not seen them for the past 15 years because they are gone. They have left the building. But what happened back then is every team came down and you'd stop behind Wally, he's sitting in a chair, put his foot on a button, the, the gizmo would spin around until your films came up. And he'd say, what's going on? And the student would say, well, this is a 42-year-old woman with lupus who comes in with a fever, shortness of breath, and a productive cough. He said, what do you think? And he'd, 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 uh, he'd sort of point to that. And you'd say, well, it looks like pneumonia. And he would say, no, look at that. That's tuberculosis, and here's why. It was wonderful. It was interactive. It, he was incredibly charismatic and fun, a little terrifying when you're a med student. Well, it turns out about 15 years radiology went digital. The, the, that the films left the building, the machine uh, that carried the films left the building. Digital radiology was invented. It turned out now when we were getting an x-ray, we weren't getting a chest x-ray which spat out two films. We were now getting a CAT scan or an MRI which spat out 100. It cost four bucks a copy to print each film. The cost of digital storage plummeted, those two curves crossed, and really in about a year, the radiology was transformed to digital radiology. So we now have a system called PAX. There are no more films. There's no more, that machine's called an alternator. All gone. It's all digital. You could see your films everywhere. Now, I've asked people who were there at the creation of digital radiology, and I've read everything I could read about it, did anybody anticipate that the digitization of the film would change the nature of those rounds? And the answer is not anyone that I can find even gave it a moment's thought. But you know what happened. As soon as radiology went digital, those rounds ended. Nobody said that they should. Nobody wanted them to end. We all liked them. But it turned out you didn't need to go to radiology anymore to see your films because your films were now images and they were ubiquitous. And so people stopped going down to radiology. And the radiologists, I'm told, for about a month were pretty happy because all of a sudden they didn't have all these annoying physicians coming down to get in the way. They could just do their work. And then they started getting really, really lonely because they're sitting there now essentially commoditized doing this work, sort of functionaries, reading a film, uh, dictating a report, not seeing the frontline clinicians anymore. And we, I'm old enough to remember what it felt like, we lost something very important in that collegial exchange. Turns out one of the founders of digital radiology is this gentleman, his name is Paul Chang. He's a radiologist and informatics expert at the University of Chicago. And uh, Paul Chang's dad, it turns out, was a radiologist as, as well. You would think if your kid goes into your field, invents digital radiology, was won all sorts of awards. You'd think your dad would be very proud of you. His father's nickname for his famous son is the man who ruined radiology. Because radiology is now a very angsty field with a lot of, a couple of years ago, the number of med students applying to radiology plummeted, partly because they're worrying about whether or not there will, there will be real live people radiologists 30 years from now. I think that's a legitimate concern. But even in the short term, this loss of connection with the frontline clinicians is very real and quite troubling to many of them. So let me just give you some of the things that I drew from that example, because I think it, it's a canary in the coal mine. Radiology went digital before the rest of medicine, so we can sort of see that movie and learn from it. Here's the first thing. The digitization of the thing, in this case the x-ray, creates the opportunity for infinite distribution at no incremental cost. 
That's scalability. That's the financial model, by the way, of Facebook and Twitter you, and, 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 uh, and Google. You build it once. You build it really well. You scale it so everybody can, can use it. You figure out a way of charging for it, largely in the form of advertising, and pretty soon you're worth, uh, worth half a trillion dollars. Uh, social relate. Here's the part we didn't understand. Social relationships and communication patterns that depended on gathering around the thing or, or interacting around the thing in some ways uh, will wither or certainly will be transformed in a way that none of us anticipated. Power relationships mediated by who controls the thing will be renegotiated. It used to be in radiology, you had to go down to radiology world to look at your films. Now you don't and they've lost a lot of power and some clout uh, because of that. But that's not what's interesting. What's interesting now is the digitization of the entire medical record, including the results or the, the outcomes of, of, of VR as well. So the fact that the medical record is now a digital entity creates the opportunity for all of these things to happen uh, both by us and to some extent to us. This is where I knew things really were off the rails. This is an advertisement I found for an emergency medicine job in, uh, in Arizona a few years ago. Starts Arizona General Hospital coming to, uh, to this uh, Phoenix suburb. Uh, it's a pretty tiny boutique general hospital, which sounds kind of nice. And here's what they offer. Remember an advertisement for an ER doc, so they do have an ER, which is nice. Uh, radiology suite with the latest toys, two state-of-the-art ORs, outpatient surgery, little tiny place, 16 inpatient rooms. Only one part of the ad was in bold, clearly their main selling point. No electronic medical record. This is advertising for a doctor saying, you two can uh, write an indecipherable chicken scratch on pieces of paper. So we clearly did not get the rollout of the electronic health record and the digitization of healthcare right. And I think it's in large part because we truly didn't think or didn't understand the impact on people, on workflow, on business models and all of that. So here are some of the lessons and I think some of these are relevant uh, to, uh, to what we've been talking about today. My view is that healthcare IT has to go through four stages. The first is the record has to be digitized. The second is all of the parts have to connect, and uh, one of the speakers earlier today made the point that the, that the VR machines have to connect to the electronic health record, both for inputs and for outputs. So this is, uh, the, the term of art is interoperability. This is your Epic system connecting to a Cerner system. This is a primary care system connecting to a hospital system. This is your Fitbit connecting in. This is your VR, virtual reality uh, uh, machine connecting to, uh, to, uh, to the Epic system and the in the enterprise. All these things have to connect and they have to connect in a relatively seamless way so that it is not massively burdensome to connect the, the, these parts together. The third is we need to glean meaningful insights from all of this digital data sloshing around through the system. The fourth is we need to convert these insights into action that improves healthcare value, improves quality, safety, patient experience, or decreases cost. Where are we today? We've done that. I think we're done. I don't think we've done that, we haven't done that, and we haven't done that. And that's why we're very early in this entire journey because we won't get to uh, nirvana here until we've done all four of these things. The next part is connecting all the pieces, starting to get a little bit better. Certainly Epic to Epic connects pretty well, but not Epic to Cerner, not outpatient to inpatient, not your Fitbit or your talking scale to everything else. Gleaning meaningful insights from the data, virtually not at all. I can tell you that because my son who lives here in Los Angeles uh, also works in a really information intensive business that's completely digital and he can tell you everything about everything. He can tell you who the people on in his organization who are really good, not good, how they can be better, how they can fill holes in the organization to make things better. Those are all things I can't tell you anything about he works for the Los Angeles Dodgers and he does baseball analytics. So they have, they have amazing capacity to take their data and come up with insights in a way that is far, far, far beyond anything I can do uh, despite working in a $4 billion uh, medical enterprise. Here's one of the lessons I came to learn about this. Uh, this is a, a, the, a term from Eric Bernoffson, who's an MIT scientist, called the productivity paradox of IT. The productivity paradox, which Bernoffson coined in 1993, was from his observation that every industry digitized and massively hyped the digital transformation. It's gonna be great, it's gonna make quality better, it's gonna massively improve productivity. Now why did they hype it? Partly because 
that's how they sold it. That's how otherwise people probably wouldn't have gone through the pain of digitizing. But they truly believed, based on the early data and experience, that it was going to be fantastic. The paradox, of course, is that it didn't work. The paradox is they digitized, and a year or two or three or five went, five went by, and lo and behold, they were not seeing the productivity gains that they had been promised. This Nobel Prize winning economist in 1986 said, you can see the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics. So I'm, I go on the factory floor and there's computers everywhere, but we're not seeing the productivity gains. The good news and the reason that I'm now quite hopeful about all of this, and I think what I've heard today makes me even more hopeful, uh, although I think the hype is still, we're still at the hype uh, stage, as has been pointed out, is that the productivity paradox almost invariably gets better. It takes on average about 10 years before the productivity gains that were promised in the beginning begin to be realized. I think in healthcare it will take more like 15 years because we are more complex, because we're more tightly regulated, because the idea of Silicon Valley failing fast is not that attractive if failing means killing somebody, killing a patient. We have malpractice suits. We have a lot of reasons why it's going to go a little bit more slowly, but I do think it will happen. The two keys from Bernjofsen's research and others are that the technology needs to get better, and we've heard a lot about the technology getting better today, and it's pretty cool. It turns out that is not the main key. The main key is what Bernjofsen refers to as reimagining the work. It is saying, what are we trying to do here, and how do we do it in a new way, taking this technology and applying it? It's not technology first. It is work and purpose first, and then saying, how can technology be an enabler? Now, why don't we do that at the very beginning? Why do we get it wrong when we digitized healthcare? It's because humans are not creative enough to do that right out of the box. So what if, if those of you who are clinicians know the physician note in Epic, what does it look like? It looks like a piece of paper. It lives under a tab. When a young person looks at it, they say, why does it look that way? Why doesn't it look like a Facebook wall or a Twitter feed, or why isn't it collaboratively created by a team a la Wikipedia? Why doesn't it have audio? Why doesn't it have video? And the answer is because all we could think of doing was digitizing the note, and the note was a piece of paper in a chart with a tab, so that's what we did. That's why you need young people around, because they are capable of reimagining the work. They're the ones likely to say, this makes no sense for us to do this thing this way. Let's come up with a new way. Now, I am actually now quite optimistic about this because I think we actually are entering a new phase in the last couple of years, and let me just tell you briefly why. The winners in the electronic health record derby, meaning the companies that now basically own the electronic health record space, are companies built specifically for that purpose. So Epic, Cerner, Athena, all scripts. That's actually quite interesting and would not have been what you might have predicted 25 years ago when other companies that were in this space included IBM, General Electric, some of the great technology companies in the world who said this is a big market, healthcare is 18% of the GDP, we'll go in and do it. They all fail. So the non-healthcare specific digital or technology companies failed in their efforts to build an electronic health record. Why? Because it turns out you needed to understand a lot about healthcare to get this right. You didn't need to know what a potassium was and know what morphine was and did and know what it's like for a doctor to order medicine and how it goes to the pharmacy and how it goes then to Walgreens and all that. And, and a generic tech company could not get that right. So those were the companies that had systems that were ready when healthcare finally went digital over the last five years. These companies have no real expertise in anything other than what they did, which is to build an electronic health record. So if you think about the kinds of competencies you'd want to have today, virtual reality is probably one of them or things that are like it, but consumer-facing tools VR, I think, is, is part of that, that general rubric. Uh, attractive and usable user, user interfaces, learning from data, communication, visualization, population health. You can sort of go on in, in the list. These are things that these companies are trying to learn to do, but that was not part of their core competencies out of the box. Some of the reason I'm optimistic is that the architecture of, of technology is getting better and easier, largely through APIs. It's easier to take a third-party tool and connect it to Epic. It does not involve 10 trillion hours of, of programming time, and that's going to get even better. And we're starting to see examples of reimagining the work, and we've seen many here, and I've seen some at my place where smart people come in and say, let's think of a brand new way of doing this this thing that we've always done a different way. And so I think it's, we're entering a very exciting phase. 
So let me kind of end with just a few observations and, uh, about uh, virtual reality. I wrote this before I heard today's talk, so I, I think the most striking thing I've heard today is the linkage to the opiate epidemic. I think the idea that, that the opiate epidemic provided an opening, and I don't think this is sort of opportunistic in a bad way, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to do if you're looking for the, what is the business case and how do we brand this new technology to say here is this massive, horrible, tragic problem and if you're a patient and or if you're a doctor, you're in this incredible double bind where patients still have terrible pain and you now don't have your main tool to deal with it. I think it's a, actually quite a, a reasonable uh, approach. So uh, that's one of my big take homes for today. Implications though, there's no question it will be overhyped and we're, we're hoping maybe it's on that right, that, that better part of the hype cycle where it's beginning to reach that plateau of productivity. Uh, it will be crucial, this point was made earlier, but I think it's absolutely true. If it's a standalone system, then I think it will always be uh, almost a toy. It will be a, a, a nice little thing to have and patients will use it. It has to be integrated into the broader system, which means it has to connect to the electronic health record. It has to be something the doctor can order, the nurse or the tech can put on, information from its use comes back into the system, all of that. It has to be just another tool that people have in the healthcare system that can be measured and analyzed. Figuring out the use cases, the impact on people and organizations, and the business and political opportunities and obstacles will be far more important than improving the technology. The technology gets 50% better, but the use cases haven't been worked out or, the, uh, uh, or you haven't figured out the return on investment to a healthcare organization, then the techno I don't care how good the technology is, it, it won't fly. And many uses won't become clear until it's actually in widespread use. And my favorite quote here is, is from Henry Ford, who is reputed to have said, if I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. They had no ability to understand the implications of the car until there were cars. And then they said, oh, this is cool. And now we can build suburbs. And now we need gas stations. And now dot, dot, dot. Steve Jobs' genius, of course, was to be able to somehow have that view of what people wanted before it was built. But that's what one in 10 trillion people do that. Most of us aren't that brilliant. And most of us need to have the tool out there. And then the use cases begin to emerge. So I'm in with this. Uh, this is the, the, uh, the Choloteca River in Honduras. And this is a part of Honduras that gets a lot of hurricanes, terrible weather. And about 30 years ago, the Choloteca Bridge was fraying. They needed to build a new bridge. And because of the frequent hurricanes down there, they knew they needed to build a very strong bridge to withstand a hurricane. They called the world's leading bridge design firm, which was in Japan. And they said, we need a new bridge. It's got to be really a terrific bridge that will hold up in a hurricane. So they built this bridge, the Choloteca Bridge. And lo and behold, a few years after the bridge goes up, as they worried about, along comes comes Hurricane Mitch, uh, and it blows down hundreds, thousands of houses, kills a lot of people, terrible, terrible damage, and the bridge is left standing with barely a nick. And you can imagine the bridge designers in Japan giving themselves high fives about what a great job they had done. They were very proud. Uh, there was only one little problem, and that was that the river moved. So this is health care. This is where the river is. We have built a very powerful, wonderful bridge that is, doesn't fall down very easily. And a place like Cedar sinai built one, a place like you have built one. We built a bridge over fee-for-service. We built a bridge over keeping the hospital full. We built a bridge over, here we are, you'll come to us when you're sick because we're wonderful and, and US News thinks we're terrific. That's where the bridge, that's where the river was. It's not there anymore. The river is over who can figure out ways of delivering care that is high quality, safe, satisfying, equitable, accessible at the lowest possible cost. Uh, that bridge is going to be made up not completely of, but largely of digital or certainly digitally enabled. And if you just do the digital, if you just have the, the, the tools, the EHR, virtual reality or whatever it is, uh, you won't get it right. It's going to have to have a very important component of reimagining the work. So as you're building your systems, you need to make sure that you have the people and the culture who are the ones who will say, here's the tool, but that's not the answer. The answer is what are we trying to accomplish and how do we think about the work in a very new way? Thank you so much for your attention. It's been a pleasure.